Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Michael uh, Sinatra, uh, I'm the director of the Centre de Recherche Interuniversitaire sur les Métiers Numériques, and it's my great pleasure to welcome today uh, Daniel Paul O'Donnell from the University of Lethbridge uh, as one of our guests here at McGill. And I want to thank Stephen Sinclair for hosting the talk uh, today. Um, Dan has been involved in a series of projects over the years, and I had the pleasure of working with him when he was president of the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities a few years ago, and now very much involved in scholarly commons. And he's going to tell us today about um, the next step of an exciting project. So, Dan, that's you. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a kind of premiere of uh, something that we're working on at the Scholarly Commons Working Group at Force 11. Um, it's actually a, a kind of preview of the paper that we're hoping to give this year at LPUB, but need to write it for tomorrow. So I thought it would be a good chance to give it here and see if it works. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years funded by Helmsley particularly. Um, very much uh, under the leadership uh, originally of Marianne Martone at uh, UCSD and now under the Scholarly Commons Working Group uh, of which she's still very much a leader. Uh, and like so much of what I talk about, I've found over the years when I'm talking about digital humanities, so I end up going back to the very first proposal for the internet uh, or for the World Wide Web because I always find there's so much uh, from that that you in some ways, very clear understanding from Tim Berners-Lee about how things ought to work, and then sometimes a kind of useful test to see how things have lined up. And so this is um, from his conclusion, in fact, where he's talking about how we should work towards a universal linked information system. Um, he wasn't didn't think he thought graphics might be a little bit hard. Uh, that turned out not to be too bad. Um, but then this last bit about how the aim would be to allow for a place to be found for any information or reference and the results should be sufficiently attractive so to use that so the information contained would grow past a critical threshold so that the usefulness of the scheme would in turn encourage its increased use. And with so much from that initial proposal, one of the questions that you end up asking yourself is either um, how come it ended up the way it did or in this case, how come it didn't end up the way it did. And so in scholarly communications, I at least find that the fundamental question for me is we're now 30 years after the development of the web. The web was designed to disrupt scholarly communication. That was its actual purpose. As I'm sure you all know, it was uh, developed at CERN as a way of managing documentation at that lab. And yet we're almost exactly 30 years on. We're 29 years on. And in that time, uh, we're nowhere near where you would imagine that we were. Data is mostly not open. Publicly funded scholarship is mostly not freely available to the public. Promotion and funding, which is really a proxy for quality in academia, is still measured by other proxies, so citations, um, impact factors. And attempts to disrupt traditional publishing and evaluation models are better characterized by how slow they've developed rather than how quickly. Things are a lot better and they grow better every year, but the rate of change is about 2%, 2 to 3%. The number's a little bit wrong there. And as I say, this is all the more surprising because the web was designed to disrupt practice and to promote openness in science. And so many other industries were affected by this. Uh, you know, I've got a list of them here music almost immediately, film. Um, Film much later, I, I think that, you know, as we're discovering film and television through things like Netflix more than pirating, taxis, hotels, uh, newspapers, of course, have all been disrupted by this. But academics, really not. There's not been that much disruption uh, there. And it's even more unusual because you would imagine disruption would be easiest in academia because unlike rock stars, unlike taxi drivers, we're all paid from the public purse. And so in theory, it doesn't matter to me if I give away my articles in a way that it does matter to Paul McCartney. Because if he gave away his singles, he wouldn't have any income. But in my case, I'm not paid already for the stuff that I give out. So it's even stranger that the one place where this is held on has been academia. What we've been working on, and I should say, this is, you know, I'm not the first person to, uh, to say this. None of us are. Um, but what we've been working on is, uh, I, I sort of use the metaphor of server-side and client-side to discuss this problem. Uh, 
And so the problem is not the server side. So ever since the internet, uh, the World Wide Web was developed, people have been thinking about the economics of scholarly communication. In fact, it even shows up in the original proposal for the World Wide Web. Berners-Lee has a line about copyright and IP and how that's not really going to be an issue because at CERN, people are more interested in openness than closedness. And so it won't really be a big deal. And so he's tackling some of those core questions even in that initial proposal. And I think it's 200. I actually, to be honest, I wrote that down this morning and then forgot to double check, but I think it's about 200, I think it's 180. We've counted uh, of manifestos, guidelines, standards issued by bodies over the last, uh, well, 20 years or so about standards and desires and economic models for open access. So there's been an awful lot of server side work. And the infrastructure is now pretty solidly in place. 20 years ago, you might argue, well, uh, Open access sounds like a great idea. Why don't we all go build journals or whatever it is you want to do? And that infrastructure wasn't there. Um, we set digital medieval stuff about 15 years ago and it wasn't really there. I mean, we hand rolled our own XML. But nowadays it's all in place. Uh, all the tools that you would need are there. We understand how the economic models ought to work, even if you're not so happy with some of them. Uh, we at least have models for it. So we have OJS for delivering journals. We've got permanent identifiers for authors, for uh, off prints for preprints. Uh, we now have easy repositories. Uh, so Zenodo, um, Figshare, of course. Uh, we've just actually published, um, well, it's just been accepted, it hasn't actually appeared yet, but I, we ran a graduate student journal at the U of L where we decided that we wanted it to be permanent. We can't rely on the students being interested in it from year to year or paying for the upkeep. So we needed a system where we could just publish things, forget it, and it would stay identifiable forever. And that's now in place. We published the articles uh, to Zenodo, got DOIs for them. We have a website for our journal, but if the graduate student union decides they're not interested in the journal anymore, this stuff's published and it's available forever. Uh, well, for the life of CERN, however long that is. So we have the infrastructure, and then in fact, uh, Yerun Bosman and Bianca Kramer, I'm gonna show you their tool survey later, uh, project survey later. Uh, as they said to me this morning, I've got it kind of in the wrong place in the slide, but they've done a survey of this 101 innovations throughout the entire research cycle. You've probably seen this poster of theirs. It's the famous, you know, if you've ever seen a librarian research cycle, it go basically, at the U of L library, we call it the zygote to zombie cycle. It basically, from the second you have the idea, and you go for funding and then you get your article out and then it gets archived and then nobody cares anymore and then you do another one. Uh, they've gone through that whole cycle and identified tools that are open and promote openness throughout the entire cycle. So we really do have the infrastructure in place. So it really isn't a server side problem. Instead, it's a client side problem. And the client side problem is there's just no uptake for all this stuff that we have. Knows maybe a bit strong, but there's there's less uptake than you would really imagine. Some of it is official hostility. Um, so societies particularly are very worried about the impact of open journals, particularly on their funding, because the standard funding model for a scholarly society is the journal is your benefit. I will say personally, I think that's a misunderstanding uh, of what society benefits are. Uh, I was president, or chair, I guess it's called, of the TEI for six or seven years, I believe. And in that time, we gave away our main uh, benefit, which is the TEI guidelines. They're freely, they were freely available online, still are. And um, I was chair during the Great Recession in 2007. I, I started it two years before and continued for three or four years after. And our income fell a fair bit as a result of that, but we never lost it all. We were able to rebuild it back up. It exchanged basically for nothing. And the reason is because societies, I actually think, are uh, communities of identity. Nevertheless, a lot of things people think that the reason you join the Canadian Society for Medieval Studies is you want their journal in paper copy. Um, senior academics and administrators are also very used to the idea of these proxies uh, for as a measure of quality. Although in my experience, uh, both at funding agencies and in senior administration, it's actually not so much the senior administration are interested in this or worried about this as, let's say the professoriate uh, are often very, very worried about this, especially when I've been in the States talking to English departments, for example, people don't know how they would know if somebody's 
qual uh, qualified to become a professor if they haven't published a paper book. What do you do if it's not on paper? Uh, so people are very, academia is an extremely traditional area, and people are very concerned about that. And for reasons known only to themselves, historians say about open access. Don't know why, they just do. Um, they, uh, the, the American Historical Association issued this fairly famous uh, guidelines to graduate students saying, embargo your dissertation, don't allow it to appear open access, which really hurt, I think, a lot of historian PhD students who might want to publish open access. In England, after the Finch Report came out and recommended for humanities a two-year embargo period, a number of history journals uh, increased their embargo period beyond two years to make themselves ineligible under the French report. I don't know why historians hate open access, they just do. Um, the other reason is preoccupation with other matters. Uh, so people who are biologists or Anglo-Saxonists would like to be biologists or Anglo-Saxonists and not think about how do you publish biology or Anglo-Saxonist, Anglo-Saxon studies. They don't want to be librarians, they don't want to be publishers, they became academics because they want to publish their own work. Another one is simple ignorance. Uh, ignorance of both the problem and ignorance of the solutions. So if you work at a university, or even if you're a student at a university, you don't really realize the scope of the problem because publications, paywall publications seem free to you. I know when I teach my, um, my digital humanities class, we bring the librarians in and they talk about the per use costs of some of the journals and students can't believe it. Um, but you know we're never charged for that. It's a version of the three part, third party payer problem. But also, most of us learn how to become academics by emulating other people, which means our model of how to publish is set by the previous generation, not the coming generation. And so, as a result, you learn from your supervisor how to be a good, in my case, Anglo-Saxonist, or, or a good uh, Baudelaire scholar, or whatever. Um, and so you learn automatically what worked 25 years ago, uh, not necessarily what's working now. And then that feeds back into two, your supervisor's presumably preoccupied by being your supervisor, not a librarian or an archivist. A fourth reason is cynicism or realism, which is, as I said uh, once in discussion, actually with the president of the AHA, my problem with the AHA saying you should embargo your dissertation was not the advice, which is perhaps even good advice for a brand new PhD student. It just shouldn't be official advice. Um, however, uh, supervisors will give advice because it's not your PhD student's duty to sacrifice their career in order to improve open access for everybody else. So you might deal with that. I was a department chair. When we are running people through tenure committees, I may realize that people trying to reason back from impact to a journal uh, is a bad practice, but if it's helping my candidate, I'm not going to say anything about it because it's not my place to change how a tenure committee works in order to correct rather than get this person through. And even if you may just despair, uh, some of the, you know, I, I can't, my father used to say, you can't be in a department for very long and not hate everybody after a while. That's maybe a little bit rough, but after a while you do start wondering, well, I'm not going to be able to change my belief. So there is a kind of realism or perhaps cynicism that I can't change it. This is just the way it's always been. What am I going to be able to do about it? And then finally, there's a kind of just don't know what to do. So often when people hear that I do open access work and uh, people will say to me, yeah, I don't really know how I can do that. I don't, you know, all the journals in my area are paywalled, I think, or I don't know how do I, I don't know how to green archive something. So this is, this is the problem why open access hasn't actually uh, caught on, I believe. We, so the scholarly commons is actually an attempt to address the client side of this, which is really a human problem. It's not really a technical problem or an economic problem. And so we want to address the question of why researchers don't want to embrace, might or might not have embraced open science and open scholarship. So that's by and large reasons two to five on that previous slide. If you hate it, there's not too, too much we can do, at least not directly. So we can make it easier to practice open science and open scholarship. We can get around ignorance, um, and we can provide a way of practicing what you want to preach, that is to say, addressing the cynicism or the realism, in a way that allows you to be realistic, but also live up to your ideals. Um, and in a certain sense, that actually does address reason one, because 
you know, one of the most profound things ever said in the history of human thought is uh, in The Incredibles, where um, whatever that bad guy is says that once everybody's super, nobody's super. And the same things here are true. If everybody's open, then even the historians will ultimately become open because they're historians. They don't want to be uncool. So what is the history of uh, this project? Well, it started with actually something at Force 11. Uh, Force 11 is, uh, stands for the Future of Research, Communication, and E-Scholarship. Uh, it's a group uh, started primarily in the sciences um, that was uh, dedicated to initially thinking about how to get beyond the PDF. In the sciences, they're particularly slavishly addicted to the PDF. And they, the, some of their original founders were, for instance, particularly interested in dynamic papers. Uh, what can you do with data so that if I publish an article on my work, you can actually manipulate the data right away. But it's expanded beyond that now. We run a conference every year uh, called uh, uh, Force Now. So in fact, I'm in Montreal next October. We just discovered 11th and 12th, I think it was. Um, and one of the things that we've done traditionally there, although we didn't do it last time, is we do something called a 1K challenge. We'll get people to give us uh, five, six thousand dollars to sponsor, and then we divvy out one thousand dollar prizes to people who've got the most interesting small project that they can do. And so one of them was this by Sarah Callahan, who's um, I, I should have written down the university. I can't remember which university she's at in the states anymore. But she asked. Uh, this was actually on the 350th anniversary of philosophical transactions in Oxford. What, happened, what would happen if we threw everything out and just started all over again? Our entire communication system is based on the journal because we've got 350 years of tradition on that. What if we didn't have the journal behind us? What would stuff look like? So uh, Marianne Martone actually went to Helmsley and got uh, some money for that question. Could, what could we do with this? Uh, we got almost a half million dollars in fact from them uh, in 2015. And we ran a couple of workshops inviting people from across the fields. Uh, to address this. The first question in uh, Madrid, we had a meeting in Madrid where we invited people from across disciplines, from publishers, from academia, from various regions around the world, and we said, well, what if we were starting all over again? What would it look like? And then we had another meeting uh, in San Diego that fall where we, we took what people had developed in Madrid, we sort of worked on it a little bit, presented it again, and then people looked at what is our current practice and how does it work out. And, and the material from the scholarly comments really comes from that. Um, so our first thing, and I'm sorry about the size, there were 18 of them, there's not much I can do. Um, we ended up with 18 principles uh, based on the analysis of, um, of what people had said there. We asked people essentially one of these stick it note exercises where you get people to write down what they want. And there were 18 of these. Um, if you go through them, you'll find that, as is often the case, if you develop something like that, they're a little bit contradictory at times. Um, it's kind of a consensus view. There's probably not much here that you would disagree with, but if you really stop and think about it, some seem to contradict each other. Some seem to, there's some gaps. Um, there is a blog, actually, that I can point you to where we've got these plus the other ones. And so we worked on this for a little while. Um, and, well, actually, I should probably just go through a couple of them. Um, so the E ones at the top uh, stand for that it's equal. And so it's things like that our scholarly communication world would be developed and governed by its members, so not driven necessarily by, for instance, commercial interests. Uh, it should be open to everybody who wants to participate and accepts its principles. An issue that you'll see as we talk about it um, that comes up an awful lot is about exclusion from, from participation in science for non-scientific reasons. And I should say, when I'm using science, I mean science and scholarship, even though they're, they're quite different enterprises in some way. In this area, we're talking about participation in the exchange. Um, again, the next one, the Commons welcomes and encourages participants of all backgrounds. In some ways, that sounds a lot like the second one. It assigns credit and responsibility for all contributions without imposing an intrinsic hierarchy as a version of the authorship question. This is actually a very interesting one that I'll, I'll talk about when we talk about a, a modified version of these. And one of the reasons is this turned out to be a real disciplinary difference. So amongst the scientists, they could not see how you could not have attribution. But in the social sciences and to a lesser extent in the humanities, there are a number of circumstances in which people don't want to be attributed uh, by name. Uh, it can be uh, that you're doing something dangerous, 
so, you know, women's studies in Iran was an example. Somebody actually gave an example of. Um, it can be for uh, ideological reasons that you don't want to do this. So there's a number of collectives that have published over the years where they do not want to attribute uh, uh, authorship to any individual. The Commons will contribute, accept all contributed objects that adhere to its guidelines on an equal basis regardless of form. The origins of that was the question of uh, micropublication in sciences, data publication, software citation. If you work on software, currently there is a hierarchy. Uh, the hierarchy is you get credit for articles, but you don't, uh, for instance, for doing software, at least not the same kind of credit. Um, within an article, there's the famous problem of medical statisticians. They always show up as fifth author. They're essential to the work, but they never are first author, and in fact, often have trouble with tenure. Uh, because they're just never first authors. Um, the com Commons has no intrinsic hierarchy, scores, ranking, or reward systems. Uh, we had some representatives from Elsevier and Nature on this group, but we also had some representatives from PLOS. Uh, and so this is one of the areas where they fought that out, but again, to do with genre. Uh, we have a whole section of stuff on open. And again, this was you know work where we kind of iterated our way through, and this is what we came up with. The common is open by default. The standards are free to use and remix by humans and machines, uh, unless there's a compelling reason not to, so personal health work. FAIR, Force 11 is one of the groups that was developing FAIR at the time. Uh, stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable. It's an uh, acronym to really indicate whether or not your research is fully open. So it should be interoperable and reusable humans and machines. This is a place where the humanities tends to fail very badly, but the sciences tend to do a lot better. Uh, then we have a different kind of statement, but a publisher is in the commons as any entity that will ensure their fair. Uh, and all outputs are considered publishable when they're made available according to the principles and standards of the commons. Again, how do you deal with preprints and that kind of stuff? Um, then we have uh, the series of S's that has to do with sustainable, so there's a global commitment amongst people to participate in it. All activities that take place in the commons remain in the commons. This is part of commons theory, the idea that a commons is strong because people contribute to it, but you don't extract from it. Uh, then you share what's available there. Um, that uh, the use of the commons cannot devalue the commons. So this is an interesting case to do with commercial publishers and open access, for example. Um, and there's an expectation of service by commoners. So if you're going to participate in all this, you have to support it. You can't just extract. And then finally, RC stands for research. Uh, I can't remember what the C stands for, but it really means research driven, uh, that the community is supposed to deal with it itself. So the community exists, the uh, commons exist independently of technology. Nobody can have a specific, you can't require a specific way of doing stuff because technology ages. You can't have a specific economic model because that stops other people from coming up with stuff. Uh, incentives apply to all stages of the research cycle and are designed to reward behaviors that support the best scholarship. Those of us who work in universities are well aware of the degree to which our reward systems, I'm sure you are, if not, congratulations, because you had a term life. But the rest of us are aware of the extent to which our reward systems actually distort behavior. Uh, at, you know, People try to publish a lot. Uh, they do micro publications because the more CV lines you have, the better. Uh, you include authors as authors, which I currently do, for example, because there's no point crediting somebody in, in an acknowledgement. So on my projects, anybody who's done something that the work wouldn't, extend, wouldn't exist without is an author. Um, that doesn't mean they actually wrote the stuff, but my behavior is being dictated by the reward system. My journal doesn't publish uh, reviews because I don't get the money from Shirk for it. Um, and uh, finally, that the form of the research is determined by the needs of the research rather than the demands of tradition. And this was actually something that comes out of Phil Warren, who was also one of the uh, founding members of Force. And um, he's quite a famous person in uh, medical data, particularly. And he always points out that he has a database of compounds that's used in pharmacy. And he is most cited publication, and it's, I believe, thousands of citations, is the article describing the fact that this database exists. And the reason is because there is no traditional way of citing a database. So everybody cites the article. And the only reason he published the article was so people would have something to cite. Um, and so that's an example of behavior that's not being driven by the needs of the research. 
So this came out. If you you know, I went through that there because if you if you listen very closely and sort of think through, you'll probably see that some seem contradictory. There seems to be some gaps between them. There's some issues about reward and participation. So what we did was uh, we the steering committee thought about these uh, for about six months, and then we had another meeting where we brought people in. And we defined the, we tried to refine the principles and essentially come up with a generative set that we thought all of those 18 were lying underneath. And this is the generative set that we came up with, and this is kind of what we're now starting to sell. Uh, and it's three principles and three rules, although it's a little bit misleading because there's a bit of a hierarchy to them. So we think that underlying all of this is a set of principles that say the scholarly commons is an agreement among knowledge producers and users that knowledge should be freely available to all who wish to reuse it, and that participation and use of not production and use of knowledge should be open to anybody who wants to participate. And then that there's three rules implied by this, and one of them is that the rewards for participating in the commons fundamentally have to be access, opportunity, and attribution, and nothing else. You can have one of the things I'll talk about in a second is you can have external systems, but they're secondary systems. So the fact that you can get tenure is not an attribute of research, it's an accidental fact of research. But if you make tenure a condition for producing research, then you're destroying the commons. Um, the commons is agnostic regarding form and technology, so we don't care if you're publishing it uh, as an in principle. We don't bias the research uh, world towards articles as opposed to software or anything else. And then finally, and this is one place where our system seems to be different from a number, uh, we are also agnostic about the use of external systems to the commons. So we define what it means to participate purely in the exchange of knowledge. That means that there are other systems, uh, but as long as they don't harm the, the free exchange of knowledge, then we don't have any problems with them. So if you think, for example, about mathematicians, there was the Elsevier boycott amongst mathematicians, that's really a case of an immovable force hitting another immovable force. The mathematicians refuse to publish with Elsevier. Elsevier refuses to let them off the hook. Uh, one side or the other side is going to win, but it's a zero-sum game. And in our world, uh, partially because we've been working with publishers, and literally some of my best friends are vice presidents at Elsevier, um, because we've been working with publishers, this system is not going to work if the commons will die if we cannot work with existing publishers. So the question is not how can you kill Elsevier or Blackwell, the question is how can you create a system in which the incentives to people like Elsevier and Blackwell are aligned with the free, inter uh, free exchange of publicly funded knowledge rather than the current system which is they essentially try to seek rent by closing off access to publicly funded knowledge. So in this view, uh, a publisher, for example, uh, those of us who know Marin Deco, uh, the freemium model would be an example of an external system that is commons compliant in the sense that he is ring fencing some things, but he's not ring, ring fencing the content, he's ring, ring fencing the tools that allow you to better search the content. And so he's not extracting from the comments, he's supplying a service that you could use. And in fact, I've been told by publishers that let's say in depths of their strategic wings, they believe that the ultimate place where publishers are going to make money is on finding stuff. Ultimately, publication is not going to be the place where the subscription is not where the money is going to be in the end. Being able to navigate that world is going to be the place where the money is. So this was, this was actually a very, very core part of what we were working on, uh, was with these principles. Um, and at the very end, I'm going to kind of ask you what you think of them. But we've we've had these now for I guess almost two years, and we've tried them out with different people. And as far as we can tell, they seem to work. Um, and we're still working on how this will come out. In fact, I'm thinking of um, of a partnership grant that will involve some of the research will involve this. But I see them. I was one of the people involved, particularly on the principal side. I see these largely functioning as a kind of badging system which is to say you identify with the principles of the commons and then it allows you to say there are certain things I can't do. So currently, for example, if I show up at that tenure committee, remember I was saying that realism and cynicism, I show up in a tenure committee and I think that we're paying too much attention to impact factor. It's really a question of how convincing I can be if I'm going to really stand up for it. But if I ascribe to the commons, these are things that I agree to 
So this particular, this last part is the one that if I'm on a committee and people are in fact misusing the commons, the idea is that I have something that I've essentially badged myself as and I'm able to say, I, I can't do that one because um, it, it would harm the commons to, you know, uh, say, why has this person not, why is this person publishing in PLOS and not Nature? If the reason for that is there, are, you know, for instance, I only want, I only, I want all my junior faculty to publish in subscription only journals, which I've actually heard. Um, I can say I can't use that as a criteria. This has actually come up. I just heard I'm, I'm the chief negotiator for my faculty association. I was at the CAT uh, chief negotiators forum. And an issue that is coming up at a lot of faculty associations this round of negotiations is how to handle student questionnaires, uh, anonymous student surveys. And in Toronto, apparently, uh, I was told, what's happening is there's a kind of cabal now of senior uh, professors who are refusing to acknowledge, basically, student questionnaires. When they're being asked to evaluate tenure cases, they're writing in the letter saying, I did not consult the student questionnaires because they're statistically meaningless. And this is a line that uh, a group of professors are starting to use as a way of destroying that system. Um, so this, I've, I've always sort of imagined it would work that way. So we've now taken that, and although I've said I think this is largely a client-side issue and that most of the tools are in place, that doesn't mean that there are there's no need for tools. So we've also developed a couple of other uh, things that we're working on. One of them is decision trees. Uh, this is one of our sub-working groups. And this is to make it easy. Remember, the way to, to try and overcome or to essentially operationalize that, that fact that people want to be open is to make it easy for them to be open and not require them to be an academic. So one of the things we've got is decision trees. And this is basically a way of going through your practice. And um, we've been working on a matrix of scholarly outputs, uh, what kinds of things can you do, how could they be open, how could they be closed, and essentially it's a, it actually comes from a policy software um, uh, approach, but it's basically a set of yes-no questions where you run, run through figuring out what your material is open. This particular chart that I've got here is actually about open grants, um, which I've never seen in the humanities, but is actually a relatively uh, an up-and-coming thing in the sciences. Um, in fact, our, I believe our Scholar Commons grant is an open grant, we published it. Uh, Rio, the journal, has got a special category, for instance, for publishing unsuccessful grant applications. Um, I guess there's a lot of knowledge built into them. Anyway, this is one of them where, uh, I can, it's very small so you can't see it, but it says, has the grant proposal been written? Uh, yes or no? Uh, if the answer is no, and then is, is there a known suitable method for writing it openly? This includes permission to publish, so I guess is the rules for the granting agency that it's secret or not? If the answer is no, then it says, well, you're not really going to be compliant. And if the answer is yes, uh, it, you're supposed to go to publishing proposals, which is the second tree. If you've already written the grant, you have permission to publish it. If the answer is no, then I guess it's not open. Uh, and if the answer is yes, they've got a couple of other things that you can go to. And so this has been particularly of interest to people in medicine, uh, neuroscience. They've been working hard at this as a way of working through places where there's very, very standard types of, uh, of publications. Um, but they've been working this through. And then what's also interesting is these decision trees are themselves citable. So each decision tree gets a DOI uh, so that you can show, for instance, essentially like a lab book as you work. Um, the other thing we've got is a working group that's working on uh, enabling technology. So they're looking at cataloging um, the different uh, the different technologies that exist, looking at how they interact with each other, working out best practice. Um, a lot of these are fairly uh, rare in the humanities still that are coming along. So ORCID, um, the IDs for researchers, the use of Wikidata. I confess I've never gone to a Wikidata session, so I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, how to use open workflow components with GitHub, uh, open semantic data, open science framework. Um, working on Sci-Hub, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's this sort of Napster almost for science where this Russian woman has collected uh, huge amounts of, uh, well, it's very interesting. Uh, the publishers claim huge amounts of copyrighted material. Um, an analysis shows a fair bit of public domain material the publishers have locked down. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, 
illegal site. Um, various ways of validating, ways of preservation, best way of moving data. There's a group that are working along making sure that the core technologies that we use are identified so that when researchers come, they can say, well, this, if, if you want to do this work, this is one way to go. Uh, but if you try this other way, you will be less open. An example that I've recently come across is um, the UC system have a guideline to repositories. It's a place where I find uh, my colleagues are very, not really understanding the difference. So academia.edu, ResearchGate, Figshare, Zenodo, your institutional repository, what's the difference amongst them all? Well, really, uh, ResearchGate and academia.edu are not actually repositories. Uh, they just look like them. They're really uh, social networks. And amongst other things, the licensing will forbid you. Uh, the, both ResearchGate and academia.edu reserve the right to take your stuff down at any moment without notice. Uh, so there's no long-term preservation there. They give out DOIs, but that doesn't mean your stuff is preserved. Figshare, on the other hand, is a commercial site, but they actually have archival standard uh, archiving for there. And then this is the one uh, my uh, Yuren Bozeman and Bianca Kramer are actually part of the, in fact, very important part of the, of the Scholarly Commons Working Group. As they pointed out to me this morning, it's really wrong to put this here because it predates uh, this section. We didn't do it after San Diego. But this is, in fact, the chart that I was talking about where they've gone through hundreds of uh, these. It says 101, but they've done more than that. Uh, hundreds of these tools and processes and then laid them all out in each section. and. Uh, uh, so that you can see, you know, basically assess how open they are. So, how is this all supposed to work? Um, well, this is me now. Um, basically, my own sort of thinking behind this is that disruption happens when you've got three different things going. Uh, you need to have the desire for change on the part of individual actors. You need to have the technology and models that enable the disruption if people want to do it but you also need to have a social license uh, that permits individuals to use the technology to challenge the system. And if you don't have those, then you might have the materials for it and you might have the wish, but you're still gonna be boxed in. <coughs> and that really is in a certain sense where we are with uh, scholarly communication right now, which is most people, if you stop them and ask them in the hall and they don't get too cynical about it, would say that they do believe that publicly funded research ought to be publicly accessible. If they know how expensive it is and how inaccessible it is. Uh, and we absolutely have the technologies and models for the change. But there is no social license for it. Uh, we're not teenagers. And so as a result, Sci-Hub is not Napster, right? It hasn't destroyed the IP system of public uh, research. And the reason is because we have librarians, we have jobs, we don't want to be caught uh, breaking IP. We don't have a social license to essentially steal people's IP. Teenagers did. And so that's why the music industry was destroyed. Um, people with uh, Uber had the technology, they had the desire, and then there was enough of a social license. Who cares if you're uh, undermining the taxis at the airport? Uh, there was enough of a social license that people could do that. But we don't have that in academia. But once you have the social license, then what happens is you're able to break outside that box that exists there. And that's when you get the actual innovation and you end up with an Uber, let's say, or you end up ultimately with uh, you know, the uh, Apple iStore or um, you know, with iTunes. Um, you know, Napster was only the beginning of that, but ultimately you end up with a legal system, you end up with a Netflix, uh, you end up with an Uber, uh, ultimately it's licensed. And so what we've been trying to do is essentially, is that social license part is what we think, or at least I, I particularly think, but I believe most of my colleagues in this project think, is missing. And so we have the desire to do open science on the whole. There's some people are not interested in that, but most people, if it was easy and it didn't affect them in any way, they could still do their work. They'd rather be open than not. We absolutely have the economic models and the tests, but we're still boxed in because we don't have that social license. And so what I think is going on, or at least what we're trying to do, is create the social license for doing it by providing a way of identifying yourself as a commoner in the Southern Scholarly Commons, and by providing a relatively easy way of, um, of 
making the change that you want to happen, but more importantly, of licensing you to do it. So that when you're on a tenure committee, when you're on a hiring committee, you'll have a couple of other people in your room will agree that you can't use uh, um, counterproductive ways of measuring uh, performance, for example. So what's next? Um, the first thing I think is to improve the tools. Uh, that's not actually something that I'm working on particularly, but there's other groups are. Uh, so to work on the tools that allow people easily to uh, to work with their conviction for openness. Um, we've really, for the last two years, been print testing the principles and the tools against real world uh, cross silo. One of the very interesting things about at Force 11 is the degree to which I'm working with scientists in a way I've never done before in commercial publishers. And also regional use. And those of us who are in DH will know the degree to which globalization, you know, DH took a sort of global turn five, six years ago now. Well, that's happening everywhere. And so one of the things that we're really working on right now is trying to make sure that we have real input uh, from uh, researchers working in um, in mid and low income economies as well, where, and it's very interesting actually, uh, when you see the discussions about that, the problems that we in the North have are simply magnified in the South, uh, in the sense that often, um, I, I, there's a blog by uh, a guy in India where he was talking about the degree to which um, in India, in China, I was in Nigeria, the same is true there, people are really pressured there's simply no choice. You must publish. If you're a scientist, you must publish in a nature branded journal or you must publish in uh, in a certain number of journals. And you're paid cash bonuses if you don't, if you do. Uh, my friends who work in science publishing, for example, there's a huge problem really with Chinese manuscripts that are being submitted simply because there's no, you're just not allowed to uh, contribute to anywhere other than certain journals. And as a result, you may as well send as many as you can because you want to have one of them. Uh, so regional differences are uh, really useful. And then the flip side of that, of course, is something like Cielo uh, in Latin America, where on the one hand, we're working in the north on how can we do open access? How can we build a network of publications that's free and available to everybody? They already have that in Latin America, and we're forcing them to not use that system and in fact to join the systems we have. So both to what degree uh, are people in, the, in low and mid income economies even more distorted uh, by the reward system where, where they're told how they do it in the north is the way you have to do it. But even when there's been better systems, how come we end up ignoring that as we do it? And then finally critique and improvement, uh, which is where you know we're starting to present this to as many different groups as we can and to really hear uh, what people think in terms of this as an approach. And so that's where we're at. And this is all the people on the um, on the scholarly commons working group who've been working with me. And if you look at their uh, at their positions, you can actually see it is quite a an, a multidisciplinary group of people. Thank you. Thank you. Time for questions, comments, please. This has all come from scientists, so uh, this is where we started. Force 11 was really founded by neuroscientists, and so I'm trying to work it back. Yeah, we should address the same way the scholars from human science and science and the physical mathematics. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I missed the first part. Would you would you address uh, those scholars in the same way? According to uh, yeah, I think so. This is based fairly heavily on our sort of standard presentation of this. We're trying to now formalize it into an article. Um, I would think so. One of the things we've discovered, I think, is, and in fact, we even discovered it internally working on this project, is the degree to which people in the humanities and sciences work differently. Um, we, we had a gigantic internal battle right before the San Diego uh, workshop because we developed those seven principles of research um, right like within a week of the San Diego workshop. And the more scientifically trained people, uh, we already put out the material, so we didn't know what to do. And so the more scientifically trained people felt, well, it's kind of a controlled experiment then. We'll give them the 18 and see what they come up with. 
But from the humanities perspective, if you're engaged in a dialectic and you think you have a better answer, you can't hide it. It's, it's like unethical to, to engage in a conversation where I know that there's a different way of understanding this that I'm not sharing with you. And so we have seen, you know, we've seen it even in the groups. Um, and another big fight that we had that was really interesting, I mean, fundamental disagreement over attribution, uh, where, uh, again, the scientists really could not see an ethical argument for not saying who published something, um, whereas the social scientists could simply could not agree to a system where you cannot, for ideological or other reasons, not a, you know, a grant anonymity to a person. So we ultimately, that took a long time to work out, but we've ultimately, for instance, come up with the idea that provenance needs to be at least, you know, that that there is some check on the data's authenticity uh, is, is important, but maybe not naming people. Um, the, the interesting question of what scholarship and science means, like when I write an article in the humanities, how is that, was my purpose different from a scientist? Uh, is not something that we've had to address, although I've been really, really struck by it. Um, with Also with my own graduate students, many of them have come from the sciences, it's been really interesting watching the different different way that, that, that we write. Even. Um, they don't have the same climate science program. They do and they don't. I, 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 they do and they don't in the sense that an awful lot of how you get promoted and how things work at the university and how our funding agencies work are either um, either very similar to each other or people don't realize the differences. So an example that I often give is if you think about PubMed and the JSTOR, they are basically completely different historical solutions that in some ways look quite similar but have completely different backgrounds and completely different causes. So JSTOR was really a way of shrinking shelf space and PubMed was really a way of finding stuff. And yet, now, if you were to ask three people in the hallway, I think probably if you asked a bunch of humanists about PubMed, they'd go, well, that's kind of like JSTOR for PubMed for medicine, isn't it? And if you ask scientists about JSTOR, they'd go, well, that's kind of like PubMed for humanists. And I think people don't realize it. You see that at funding agencies all the time. Peer review in the humanities is really quite different from peer review in the sciences. We call it the same thing, and our funding agencies all pretend that it's the same thing. So. You know, and same is true when you come up for a professor. When, you, when you're when you being promoted as a professor, at least at my university, I'm sure this is true in most places, the actual process is identical. It's just staff with humanists as opposed to staff with scientists. But the material they see, the expectations they bring, how you know somebody's doing a good job are completely different. And yet there doesn't seem to be any systematic way of understanding that. So it's, it's one of the interesting things I found with this whole process has been the degree to which we pretend that there's a university way of doing stuff, and we aren't paying attention to how they're actually really different from each other. But I think in the terms of the commons, these points are still, we, we were aware of that all along, and we've been trying to abstract out a bit. Um, I don't know, are you seeing areas where there's something there that you think there's, that's clearly a science thing and not a humanities thing? Not, not specifically, but... Uh... But I, I know that uh, I mean, we all know that uh, in the physics, in astrophysics, they, they already have a long practice yes. for uh, yeah. sharing free grades. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to do that in science. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a common uh, right. knowledge. Yeah. I, I have another question. Um, um, I'm really into comments myself from mm -hmm. uh, different background, but. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you see the scholarly commons as a um, Trojan horse into the academic, into the, to the system, or, or do you see scholarly commons as a, 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 a set of values that needs to be lo uh, lobbied um, to, to the top as well, and also to the political system and the institutional system? Mm -hmm. What do you see it as? Uh, since commons is, is really about the community, and, mm -hmm. and here the community seems to be the minority. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you see this minority, this community growing? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's actually both. Um, both a Trojan horse and a lobbying system. 
and so in my experience, so one of the other things that, that I've been responsible for is uh, we have this summer institute now that we're teaching in San Diego. It's based fundamentally and you know basically entirely on DHSI at uh, Victoria. But the idea was, I thought well, what's happening in digital humanities is actually quite similar to what's happening on a larger scale in, in scholarly communication, which is a technology and an approach is coming along that people can see is really important, but it's a, a, a disjunction from previous practice. Um, but one of the reasons I really like DHSI as a model for this is the focus on department heads, chairs, uh, administrators, because those are the people that need to know, right? But I think it's also a bit of a Trojan horse in the sense that I think there's enough people out there are interested in this that if they had a way of expressing their allegiance, it would undermine some of the other practice. So if you think about, for example, the story I just told you about the professors at Toronto refusing to acknowledge the value of student questionnaires as a way of dealing with what's essentially a human rights problem, but, but I think that can work the same way. And it sounds like it's mostly a storytelling to convince other people. It's mostly sort of what? It's a storytelling. I, I think there's a huge amount of that. I mean, one of the things that people criticize Force 11 all the time for, although I don't think it's necessarily a criticism, is Force 11 is extremely good at branding stuff, right? I mean, FAIR is an example of Force 11 branding. They're just really good at it. And people say, well, you know, it's not like nobody's ever thought of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable before. They go, yeah, sure. But until somebody identifies it as something you can express allegiance to, it doesn't exist. And, you know, like I was saying, I don't think that um, there's nothing new here. In, and in some sense, the commons, you could say, another criticism that I that I would give is it's not even wrong in some ways, right? I mean, it's a, a number of motherhood issues, right? Everything should be open. Uh, everybody should be accessible. But I think expressing it this way as a set of things that you can say, I am in my daily practice going to try and do this, what you actually, we don't define what any of those terms mean because our belief is that there's enough people who believe some version of this, that by collecting these ideas that are very input in people's heads and saying, this is a package of stuff. If you really believe in openness, then you need to do some version of this stuff. Then that we can trust that people will actually develop a practice that ultimately allows all of us to be more open. But I think a mistake and, and an issue with many of the manifestos is they need to have a governance system. They need to have somebody who decides if you're in or you're out. Um, there's bad guys. Um, you know, so our goal has actually been very much to avoid that. I would say by far the most important thing about the scholarly commons is the question of inside or outside. And that's whenever I've been talking to people who have other sets of manifestos, like the Vienna Principles is, is actually very similar in some ways. Um, the big difference that we have is you can be partially in, for most academics, whether or not your commons compliant is between you and God. Uh, you get to decide if you're it. You can say it's really just a way of telling other people, I wish that I want things to work like this. But as somebody from Elsevier told me, it really does work. It will work very well with Elsevier. And the reason is because the second Elsevier says we're commons compliant, there will be an Elsevier watch that makes sure they are. And so, you, I mean, it works It works both ways, right? You or I, if, if I say I'm commons compliant, but I actually hide my data, nobody will know. If Elsevier have a journal that they claim is commons compliant, but it's not commons compliant, uh, everybody will find out right away because there'll be people who will be holding them to a high standard. So I think it's I think it's a combination of both. Other questions or comments? What do you think? I mean, because I've spoken mostly to scientists, but those of I mean the humanists, what do you guys think? I mean, is it speaking to you in any way? Is that fun? Well, so yeah, but you know, in the context of what you said, that it's a it's a collection of motherhood statements that um, ideologically um, I think we can um, identify with mostly. Um, it, it seems to me that you know the, the you have to do something, and, and and what the what you're doing, developing a set of principles and a set of tools around that, I think is is great. 
it, I have this nagging feeling that um, the, the the real patching point. I'm not even sure it's sort of tenure promotion processes. I think it's it's the commercial um, entities, um, and you know your your friends notwithstanding, they, they, that I I don't see the argument that they can make a living off of discovery because I think there will be there will be too much competition there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in the nature of IP that it can be exclusive in ways that uh, tools can't be, mm -hmm. and um, it, it seems to me that, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this maybe as much uh, as a uh, devil's advocate, but it, if, if we wanted to affect change, um, sort of reproducing the math of severe conflict on a macroscopic scale would be the thing to do, because if you remove the commercial um, component, hypothetically, then we all have to figure out a different way of doing it. I mean, we're, we're very indebted to what the commercial entities do, but um, but if the bow weren't there as a force, um, we'd all have to figure out, you know, if the funding agencies can support it, if the institutions can support it, or, you know, all of those things, they would uh, create a very different model. So I'm also thinking in terms of, you know, is this sort of an incremental, slow, very slow <laughs> process of change versus other strategies? Well, that I think it is, yeah. I mean, I guess the argument I would say about the mathematicians is it's a version of prisoner's dilemma, which is if everybody's refusing to publish in nature or in lingua or whatever, then that makes it easier for you to publish in nature or lingua, right? And the trouble is that the cynical, realistic advice would be what you want to do is publish in the top journal then because the others aren't. Yeah, but they're no longer top journals if they're... Um... It lags though, eh? I mean, Lingua and Glossa, if you look at Lingua versus Glossa, I mean, all the editors of Lingua are at Glossa now. It's a fast journal, it's high quality. Lingua is still Lingua even though it's not Lingua anymore, right? Um, you know, the trouble with tradition is it lags. And in fact, you know, the great irony of all this is uh, I, some of you may know this article that uh, Cameron Nail and Martin Eve, I, Sam Moore did on, um, on excellence and why it's bad. And we published it with Palgrave uh, in Palgrave Communications, which is a nature, open access nature. And it went kind of viral right away and we had like 1,500 downloads the first day and it's the second most cited publication, it's only like six months old. Uh, it's really, you know, it took off. And we were on faith, one of its arguments is all of those factors that I just told you, we've got to stop focusing on them because they're harming science. But by God, I was writing them up on Facebook as it was coming in. You know, not that it matters, but they downloaded it 1,500 times last night. And not that it matters, but it is a nature input imprint. Um, yeah, the way to, the way to break, uh, the trouble is that lag is so long um, and so broad that my own belief is the only way of getting around it is to create a different club that you can belong to, um, as you do it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about uh, the organization of France. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that it works like uh, some of you can see, for example, with Hawking uh, Group and Cruise Group. Yeah. It's proposal and uh, then you can uh, not uh, call for uh, call for commands and all this thing. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, it, it sounds like that, but it, it isn't actually like that. And we just uh, uh, I became chair and we lost all our money. Those are not related things. It's um, the money was gone just as I became chair. Uh, we had been funded because it was in neuroscience. Uh, we'd been very heavily funded by like the NIH and uh, Helmsley and Moore as well. And we, the money, it's all been grant project, and so we're you know, right now between grants. Um, but it, it's been an interesting group to work with. Uh, like, it came very much out of data science, uh, in, in data health science. Um, Phil Byrne, who was one of the founding members, went on to become the chief data officer at NIH, uh, for example. Um, it has a number of quirks that are that are very interesting. One of them is where it's not like the W3C is it doesn't actually endorse anything. 
So even in some working groups, uh, I, I actually used a careful formulation when I said fair. I said something like it was founded via Force 11 because one of the things that Force 11 always does is it doesn't actually claim credit for it. Uh, though there's stuff, even though we end up claiming credit for them. So, for example, there's uh, data citation standards that are used now pretty much throughout the industry in, in the sciences. And that was something put together via Force 11 working group. Um, but we try not to call the Force 11 data citation standards because um, we want to give the credit to the groups that put it together. So we really see as a little bit the way the W3C works, which is as a kind of platform where industry and, and you know, people who are interested in topics come and hash them out as, as the consensus. That it's very true, but a little bit less ownership on it than, uh, than maybe the W3C does. Um, it is a very heavy science and librarian group. It's starting to move more into library than in science. And uh, there's been a, a fair bit of interest recently, particularly from Latin America, one of the humanities and social sciences working on it as well. Um, but it's, it's all about software citation, tool citation, data citation, all those things that, um, that are sort of around the article, I would argue, rather than the article itself. Is really interesting. Welcome to join. Um, it doesn't cost anything, which is one of the reasons there's no money. <laughs> It'll be the talk will we'll coincide the conference. Yes, the and there's going to be a nice conference here in the fall. So literally at McGill, where we are right now. So please join me in thanking Dan again. Thank you very much. Uh, with some of your projects.